<laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual dialogue today. It is great um, to have so many eager participants to share this conversa conversation. I'm sure it's going to be really um, thought provoking. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you all know that there will be a Q&A at the end of today's conversation. So if you have any questions uh, for our panelists today, feel free to go ahead and ask those in the chat box uh, and we will be um, sharing those with the panelists when the conversation uh, concludes. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and let everybody know um, that there is still room available for both our uh, Bavaria trip in October of next year and our Andalusia trip, uh, which will be in March um, of 2022. And it looks like something um, happened with Christina, our uh, speaker's Zoom. So I'm going to just try and help her for one second and I will be right back. So just hold on for a moment. Christina, if you want to go ahead and um, unmute and turn on your camera, you should be good to go. Great. Hello. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, so uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce Christina L. de Leon. Uh, she's the Associate Curator of Latino Design. Latino Design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. At the museum, she is responsible for researching and collecting US Latinx and, and Latin American design, as well as developing exhibitions, educational programs, and digital content that raise great awareness of design from the Americas. From 2010 to 2020, from 2010 to 2016, De Leon was associate curator uh, at America Society, where she worked on exhibitions and publications focused on modern and contemporary Latin American art. She also held previous positions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Met Cloisters. De Leon received a BA from Hobart and William Smith, an MA from New York University, and, a, and is currently a doctoral candidate at the Bard Graduate Center. I am going to try to help her unmute for one second. Okay, Thank great. <laughs> Take it away, Christina. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I'm sorry we've had so many technical difficulties as we um, got ready for this program, but hopefully this is all going to work now. So just give me one second as I share my screen and we can get started. Okay, can you see? At full screen? Yes, you're all set. Super, thanks. Um, so thank you, Carrie, for this invitation. I'm so honored that the Decorative Arts Trust um, invited me to do this talk today. Um, I'm also so, so pleased um, to have my colleague, my friend, my mentor, uh, Jorge Rivas, who is the Frederick and John Mayer Curator of Latin American Art and also the head of the department at the Denver Art Museum. Much of, I think the reason why I have the position that I have and my career has taken the turn that it has, has been thanks 
to Jorge, who I met while I was working at American Society. We were working on an exhibition called uh, Moderno Design for Living in Brazil, Mexico, and Venezuela, 1940 to 1978. And that exhibition was really a turning point for me. Um, much of my background had been in Latin American art, the traditional fine arts. While I had done a lot of work with decorative arts and material culture, it wasn't something that I had really focused on. And it was that project um, which really made me realize this area of of art history, of design history that was really lacking in scholarship and exploration um, and definitely in museum representation. So I'm so pleased that um, Jorge can, can join us today, um, who's such a decorated historian. He's an architect, he's a designer. Um, he's able to come at the work at so many different angles and, and that has taught me so much about the way that I approach my own curatorial practice. So for today, I'm going to begin with about a 30 minute presentation, which I hope I don't go um, over too much. And then um, we will, Jorge and I will have a conversation and, um, and then open it up to the audience afterwards. So, um, welcome to Cooper Hewitt. Uh, this is the facade of the back of the building with this very lovely courtyard that we have. And I just wanted to provide a little bit of a background of um, what the museum is, how it was founded. It's, it's a very interesting museum because it was founded by the Hewitt sisters that are shown here, um, Sarah and Eleanor Hewitt who were the granddaughters of Peter Cooper, who was the founder of Cooper Union um, College in downtown Manhattan. And they founded this museum with the hopes of creating a teaching museum for the students at Cooper Union. Um, and they based the, the museum um, very much on uh, the Decorative Arts Museum in Paris. Um, that was for them, um, such an important institution and they wanted to bring something very similar to New York. And so they pretty much dedicated their entire lives to the pursuit of not only founding this, this museum, but also continuing to add to the collection and to create a really robust collection that could be used by students. Um, and so the museum was founded in 1897 as the Cooper Union Museum of the Arts of Decoration. And um, over the course of its more than 100 year um, history, it has changed and morphed. Um, but uh, the collection that they started, I think really set the tone for the museum and um, the way in which we're thinking about the museum for the future um, is, is interesting when we think about its, its roots. So um, the Hewitt sisters were, although they wanted to set up this museum, the Secretive Arts Museum, um, for New York, for you know, Americans, um, they actually were not necessarily so interested in collecting work from the Americas. They were very focused on Europe um, and much of their collecting trips and, um, and work went to Europe, to European artists, to going to Europe, various European countries. And so it's interesting when we think think about sort of the importance of this museum within a US context, but also knowing that there are many important uh, examples of, for instance, um, furniture from the United States and all of the Americas um, and, and other uh, things that the museum just doesn't have a very good representation of um, because it just wasn't within the interests of, of the Hewitt sisters. But with that said, um, the Cooper Union Museum um, was quite successful, but um, there came a time that the 
Cooper Union said that they could no longer take o continue to run the museum and um, they were going to dismantle the collection, sell it off. And there was this huge um, rally to keep the museum um, intact and in New York in particular. Um, and uh, coincidentally, the Andrew Carnegie Museum, which is where we are housed today, um, here's Andrew Carnegie, here's his home. Um, by this time, the Carnegie Corporation had been leasing out this space. And after a very many years of um, championing for the collection to stay in New York. The Smithsonian decided to take over the museum. Um, the Carnegie Corporation actually um, donated the building to house the museum. Um, and in 1976, um, the Cooper Hewitt Museum, Cooper being a nod to its original um, uh, space at Cooper Union and Hewitt, a nod to the Hewitt sisters, came into fruition. So Cooper Hewitt is a really interesting space because it's a historic home and not all of the floors are um, intact, but certainly the first floor and much of the um, architectural layout of, of the home still stands. So it's, it's a challenging space. It's an interesting space to create exhibitions because we are constantly having to work around these incredible rooms, um, which, you know, if we were only showing um, historic types of decorative arts and design, maybe it would work out, but, you know, our collection spans 30 centuries of, of design and uh, there are many challenges in, in working within this space to create exhibitions that are thoughtful and interesting and also engaging to the public. So with that said, when I joined the museum, um, which will be in five years in February, I had all of this history to contend with and also the fact that, you know, I'm working with nearly 100 years of, um, you know, not complete neglect, but <laughs> there hadn't been much work done on Latin America, on Latino designers, on Latinos in the United States. Um, there also hadn't been much work done on cross-cultural currents throughout the Americas or Europe um, or Asia or other parts of the world. And so I came in with the, um, with, with essentially the work that I needed to work on a, building a collection, helping to create uh, more educational programs with our um, educational department. And of course, um, helping to develop more exhibitions and uh, you know, doing continuous work on our, our standing um, permanent collection to see the ways in which we could maybe tease out um, new stories with objects that we already had. Um, so what I'm gonna show you are objects that have been acquired since we started, since I started at Cooper Hewitt, and then also objects that I have discovered in the collection um, that we've had for quite some time. Some of these objects were collected by the Hewitt sisters, some of them weren't, um, but they're all, I think, really interesting and fascinating objects when we think about the history of design, the decorative arts, material culture um, throughout the Americas. So I'll begin with this chair. This was probably the, the most significant purchase I have made um, while I've been at the museum, which is this um, armchair made in Mexico. And um, this is actually a chair that uh, we asked Jorge to consult us with because when I first came across it um, online, actually, uh, I when I saw it, I thought, 
this chair is so magnificent and is a wonderful example in the way in which um, Chip, the Chippendale uh, uh, book not only um, traveled across the world, but the ways in which um, artisans um, in various parts of the world incorporate, incorporated the patterns um, and the designs and really made it their own. And this is a fascinating example. It's um, really beautifully carved. Um, and while my specialty really begins at the um, at the turn of the 20th century, um, while I've been at Cooper Hewitt uh, and also through my doctoral studies, I've acquired, um, a, a very, I would say, very basic knowledge of the colonial Americas because this is an area that the museum also lacks in, although we do have some really special objects, um, but are really outliers within the overall um, spectrum of, of the collection. And so as I've been working with many of my colleagues, we've been thinking about what are, what are these really special objects that we could bring in that can represent these er this early period of, of the Americas. And um, this chair uh, made in Mexico, um, which is so ornately carved, uh, is actually the first representation of a piece of furniture um, that is reflective of, um, you know, the quote unquote Chippendale style. Um, before that, as I had mentioned, the Hewitt sisters were not interested in early American design or furniture, or decorative arts really. Um, and so we hadn't really acquired any of the, the big, um, names or, or types of furniture that you would think we would have um, that I think came later on. So um, being able to have a chair um, that represents the way in which this really influential um, pattern book circulated and the way in which artisans in, in places like Mexico um, in thought about this and interpreted it was a, a really significant acquisition for us. Um, and actually it will be going on view um, at the end of this year in an upcoming exhibition. So we're, we're really excited to have it. Another recent acquisition that we made was this Barber's Basin. Um, something that we've been thinking a lot about at Cooper Hewitt is the way in which the world has been connected from a very early time. Um, and thinking about the, uh, the Americas, particularly Mexico as this international hub for um, trade and transport. And this is a really wonderful example. This Barber's Basin, which was made in China um, and came to uh, Mexico through the Manila Galleon. Um, as you can see, this, this barber's basin, this shape um, is a European shape that um, was first made um, in
Hello, there's just a slight issue with Christina's internet. One moment, um, she will be re-entering the uh, dialogue. So just hang on. And uh, in case you're worried about timing and this running over, because you registered, you will receive a link to a recording of this conversation um, in a week. So <laughs> one moment. Thank you so much for your patience. Hey, did I get kicked off? You are all set now. It looks like um, we were at the Barber's Basin when okay. we lost. Yes, no, no, that's okay. All right. Um, so we recently acquired this um, Barber's Basin, which if you see in the center has the double eagle, which is the um, Habsburg sign, which tells us that this was made for um, the Spanish market. Um, and so uh, these clues let us know that this was a work made for, for export. Um, so I'll just keep going for time's sake. This uh, fantastic uh, Peruvian mantle that was made between the 17th and 18th century is really an extraordinary example of Peruvian weaving techniques. Here, I just have a very small um, detail of this large panel, and you can see the details that go into every single inch um, of this panel. This was actually acquired by the Hewitt sisters. It was a gift from um, JP Morgan. Uh, these extraordinary sets of buttons, which are after Agostino Brunias, are a bit of a mystery for Cooper Hewitt and for many scholars, actually. This is something that we have been really wanting to dig into a bit more. Um, Agostino Brunias was an Italian artist who traveled to the Caribbean and is most known for his paintings that depict daily life in the West Indies. Um, supposedly, these buttons were part of a coat that uh, the Haitian uh, leader of, of the revolution against the French um, Toussaint Le Rotour war. We don't know this for sure. This is sort of the the story that has um, that has traveled and and has been shared throughout the last, I would say, one hundred years. Um, supposedly, uh, when Toussaint was last arrested before his death, he gave his coat to his manservant and um, who was a, a young man. And he kept that coat for many years until this coat was then um, brought to someone uh, because they needed to sell it uh, to get a little bit of money. And they realized that this coat could have um, some not the coat in particular, but the buttons uh, would have some uh, value and they were sold um, and uh, they traded through one or two hands, um, but not many until they were sold at auction. And then that owner eventually uh, donated them to Cooper Hewitt. These are buttons that we, as I said, we don't know much about. And I think one of the important things about doing talks like this is, sharing the fact that we have this type of material so that um, scholars can come and, and do this work and, and 
think about the ways in which Cooper Hewitt's collection um, can, can help further the story of uh, design and material culture um, in the region. And then the Caribbean in particular, which I feel doesn't really get enough attention. And if you see here, the buttons are probably no bigger than um, an inch and a half. Um, and uh, they're really ornately, ornately painted. Um, I mean, there's just so much detail um, in each and every button. Um, and we know that Brunias' paintings were often made into prints. Um, and those prints circulated throughout, uh, throughout Europe and throughout the Americas. So um, we believe that these might have been painted after uh, following um, some Brunias prints. Um, but again, this is work that um, we, we still need to do. I was pretty amazed when I first arrived that we had this incredible um, Jamaican tortoise shell comb um, that was made in 1671. These types of combs, um, there's, there's only a very small, small number um, that exist. Um, they were made during a very particular uh, part of uh, during a very particular time, 1655 to 1692, um, something like, you know, 20 examples exist, maybe a bit more. Um, but what's really beautiful um, about these um, combs is that um, obviously the fact that they have Jamaica and the date, but that the flora um, is all indigenous to Jamaica. Um, these were part of um, a, a trade that, that flourished in Jamaica where they would create these types of combs, um, mostly for Europeans, Englishmen who were in Jamaica to make their fortunes. And this was you know, a bit of a souvenir that Uh, from the region and, and tortoiseshell was one of these very coveted um, materials that actually um, also made it um, made the the hawksbill turtle also endangered because how much um, this material was used. This is other another uh, examples of of tortoiseshell um, objects, this casket and this peineta that um, I acquired my first year being at the museum, um, which this comb you might think is small, but it's actually probably as big as my head. Um, it's really large um, and it had been in one family the entire time. Oftentimes um, these, uh, because they're, they're such delicate carvings, um, they break and they crack, they get dry, um, but this is a, a wonderful example. A collection that we have um, at the museum that the museum has been collecting actually for some time are samplers. We actually have samplers from throughout the Americas, um, a really robust collection, um, but we have quite a lot from Mexico and um, some of these examples also have um, the names of the young women who made them, um, like this one by Dolores Orbando, um, who says, who puts in her sampler um, that it was made in 1853 um, and in Puebla. And this is another really, um, I think, beautiful example. Um, uh, maybe not as uh, sophisticately, not as sophisticated as as the other ones that I just showed. But um, what I love about the examples that we have is that you can see that there are um, their samplers made by young girls from um, various stages uh, throughout their life, um, and so this one it says in pencil um, that this was made by a girl named um, Rafaela. 
Another group of objects that I encountered when I began going through the collection were objects that showed um, pre-Hispanic imagery, but made um, in the United States uh, for US consumption. And um, this was really interesting to me because it was an interesting way of thinking about the ways in which the United States and designers have um, connected with pre-Hispanic culture and the way that they have used um, that type of artwork, that imagery to cultivate their own design practices. Um, and in the 20th century, the first quarter of the 20th century, you saw this really taking shape um, as there was a push to think about what was a You're muted. <laughs> Alex, I'm, okay. Um, so this is an example of a panel that was produced as part of, that we believe was produced as part of a um, program that happened at the American Museum of Natural History in which their collection was used as inspiration for designers to um, essentially go through a, a design education process. Um, and so um, here we have a panel and a, a pattern book actually that was produced um, by Charles W. Mead, who was a curator at the American Museum of Natural History, who pulled out various images and motifs that he found um, in Peruvian objects and, and created this book so that students could then take that and make it into um, their own type of um, designs uh, using mostly stamping, um, but you know, sometimes printed textiles, so on and so forth. Um, and so this is a really interesting, very early example of likely student work that we have in the collection. But um, we also have this um, really fascinating example by Lydia Bush Brown, um, this silk um, wall hanging, which uh, is called the Temple of the Mayan Indians. Uh, which shows um, an image of, of Tikal um, uh, in Guatemala. And then Ruth Reeves, who um, is celebrated um, for her textile designs, was really very, very influenced by um, 
Latin American indigenous culture, um, particularly uh, work done in Guatemala. Um, she spent some time in Guatemala, she spent some time in Ecuador. And so this is a, a panel that we recently acquired that you can see would have been used as a poultry um, for this um, couch. And so it's a really interesting way for us to um, discuss the ways in which uh, indigenous cultures from Latin America have been used and appropriated for um, American design um, and being much more conscious of those types of conversations we have with our objects, um, particularly when we have them on display and, and we're um, discussing you know, issues of, of appropriation um, uh, within design. Another great example by Mimi Blacker, um, which actually we, we don't know much about her. She created much of her textiles for Gailey and Lord, um, but the influence of um, pre-Hispanic uh, art is, is really obvious. And here we just have a, a, a stamp of a monkey, um, which you can see um, she also incorporates into the design on, on the top. And so I'm transitioning now to some um, contemporary acquisitions that we've made. Something that's really important to Cooper Hewitt is uh, materials um, and the innovative use of materials. Um, and so we have this chair here by Estudio Campana um, called the Cafe Chair, which is part of a series they did called Trans Plastics. Um, and so you see a, um, they, they wanted to essentially talk about the style of cafe chair that was prevalent um, throughout uh, Brazil, um, which was this woven worker-like chair, which eventually um, uh, came out of popularity um, with the more ubiquitous um, use of, of plastics. And so here they're using um, this fiber called the apui fiber, which actually, if, if it, um, when it wraps itself around a tree, it, it actually sort of swallows it and, and can kill the, the chair. I mean, it can kill the tree, excuse me. And so here they're sort of, you know, playing this with this idea, with this idea of how plastics have been killing um, uh, different types of, of craft techniques um, and, and, uh, different types of materials that have been used, but here it's the it's the other way around. It's the apui fiber sort of eating the plastic um, and taking over the, the plastic chair. And uh, on the other side, we have this stool by Fernando Mastrangelo, um, who is a designer based in New York, actually. He created this really fantastic chair um, made out of um, sugar sprinkles. Um, and uh, it's it's a chair that really vibrates with with energy when you see it because all of the colors almost you 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 can't even um, uh, concentrate your your sort of your eyesight on them because the the colors are so um, are so bright and wild um, and so when you see it in person it it really radiates. And then these are two objects that we actually just acquired within the past year. Um, this great chair um, by GT2P, which is a collective based out of Chile. This is a, a really fantastic um, uh, material that they have um, been working on for a long time. This is essentially a volcanic rock that with a volcanologist, they actually worked to develop um, a process in which they can um, make the volcanic rock into a, a sort of um, very fine powder um, that they then um, put onto a ceramic base, almost like a glaze, fired in a kiln, um, and it becomes this really sort of organic lava um, uh, material um, and surface 
And so they were at first doing stools, but now um, the work has developed into these um, other chair forms. Um, and this recent acquisition by Jamie Porter Lada, um, who is based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and is thinking about um, the ways in which the plastic bottle, particularly at the border, um, is used as a way to sustain life, um, but is also uh, a bottle that is, is found everywhere, um, shards of it, um, pieces of it, um, in the same way in which you will find shards of um, ceramic vessels um, from indigenous groups who have lived in that region. And then this really, this is an object actually we just acquired this summer um, by Emerging Objects, which is also looking at the process and the history of um, ceramic uh, pottery making in the Southwest, but using uh, 3D printing technology. Um, so this is a bean pot, a type of um, pot that would be used in that region um, to cook. Um, and this is made with um, wild micaceous clay um, that's then put into um, a 3D printer for ceramics um, and, and then fired. And so I'll just quickly go through, because um, we're almost at time, um, go through two exhibitions that I've worked on. Um, the first is Rebecca Mendez Selects. Selects is a series that the museum does in which they invite artists, designers, um, cultural figures to mine the collection and to work with the curator to produce an exhibition um, through their vision using the permanent collection. So Rebecca is a, um, a graphic designer, a filmmaker, a multi a multidisciplinary artist based in Los Angeles. Um, she's originally from Mexico. And very early on, she talked to me about the story that she had read about um, the aviaries of Tenochtitlan. Um, which was the center of the Aztec Empire. Um, and so this moment of cultural conflict of, of destruction um, was a really important um, starting point that uh, Rebecca wanted to use for the exhibition. She essentially said, I want to think about the ways in which we can explore this story um, and also think about ideas of renewal and the way in which science and design um, have, have worked together and also against each other. Um, of uh, or my left, your right, uh, um, shows um, all of the drawers out. And Rebecca sent me this image and said, I want our show to look like this, um, which wasn't quite what we did, but um, we did include nearly 40 specimens um, and we integrated them um, with uh, objects from our collection to talk about um, the story and also the ways in which birds have been um, really important for design inspiration, but also the ways in which we have used birds, um, uh, feathers, skins, things like that um, in, in much of our, our design objects. 
And then our newest exhibition, well, not so new, it's actually going to close soon. It's, it's been up um, for a few years because of the pandemic, is an exploration on this material, this dye um, called cochineal. Cochineal is a tiny insect that um, uh, lives on the nopal plant. Um, it, and uh, when you um, pinch it in your hands, um, this red dye secretes from it. And so um, this is a material that has been used by indigenous people um, in Mexico and in Peru for um, thousands of years. And when Europeans arrived, they, they quickly knew that they could essentially make it into a, a really sought after commodity, which they did. And so, a lot of work has been done around um, the history of cochineal and, and how much it was used throughout the early modern period and how it circulated the world. But I wanted to think about the ways in which cochineal was being used by contemporary designers. So it's a very small show, um, but it used some works in our collection, like this really incredible um, work called Nebula by Maria Davila and Eduardo Portillo. Um, and it also commissioned a few new works by a young designer, for instance, a young designer named Marisol Centeno, um, which we then acquired. Um, she's a, a, a textile designer based in Mexico City. Um, and this is a work in which only cochineal dyed is used. She's, she essentially, um, works to create a, a range of colors by um, by changing the, the pH and the acidity. And then some 3D printed objects um, using resin and nylon. Um, this is an example made. Uh, this is one out of a few that were made by emerging objects in which um, they used for inspiration, um, this object that was um, often used for the processing of uh, cochineal. So they looked at this. Um, these are a few other examples that they made. And then these are a few installation. This is a wonderful console um, by Gloria Cortina um, using cochineal lacquer. And you can see there's a range of colors from purple to pink to, um, to red. And I think I will stop there. I am sure that Christina's uh, video will resume in just one moment uh, and she'll be back to speak with Jorge. So just one second. Thank you all again so much for your patience. Hello. Hi, Christina. Hi, Jorge. Thank you so much uh, for this invitation and Carrie from the Decorative Art Trust. Uh, 
quite impressive uh, show of new materials that you have been acquiring. And um, I, in, you know, in the last six years uh, working at the Denver Museum, uh, I have been actively working to connect my his very historical collection with uh, more modern contemporary expressions and in, in, in design. And uh, we have been very slowly acquiring some materials that connect with the things that you have there, like we have a very good piece by Victoria Isque, uh, some um, designed by Reynaldo Lusa that can connect with the historical uh, materials that you have from the 1940s and 50s. And I know that my colleagues from uh, LACMA, that they are connected here. I saw some of them uh, typing questions. Um, they have been very diligent in collecting the Mexican modernism on the, you know, Stacy, Bobby, and Wendy uh, after the big show they did. So how are you planning to make the Cooper Hewitt collection special, different, unique uh, in the context of all, all the American museums uh, really now trying to catch up and, and collect more materials related to Latin America and the Latinos living and working in the United States? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, it's a tall order, right? I we're we're starting quite late, and there's a lot of material that um, I think we, you know, at this point, it's just it's they're so they're getting so expensive, you know, particularly like Brazilian um, modern design, for instance, where the prices are, are really almost out of reach for some um, master works. And so I think the way that I've been approaching the acquisition process is by thinking about objects that are really special. Um, so not necessarily collecting en masse or collecting everything possible, but but thinking about objects that are really special, that can tell many stories and that can be um, interpreted in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, that's not easy. And sometimes that, that's not always possible. Um, but for me, the the most important thing has been to think about the ways in which these objects can be in conversation with other things in our collection, because it's gonna take me a long time to be able to build a collection um, that is really strong and representative. And, you know, I'm not gonna be able to do that in a few years that takes resources, that takes time. Patients, as you know, sometimes objects just aren't available when you want them. Um, and so I think that patience has been like a, a big thing that I've tried to employ, um, but also just thinking about star objects that make sense for us. Because sometimes I find an object and I think it's incredible, but it just doesn't make sense for Cooper Hewitt. Um, and, you know, sometimes I just have to, to pass on it. Um, and, and that's really hard, but, you know, we're, we're getting there, I think, little by little, uh, it just takes time. So uh, another question for you will be like, uh, how, you know, the public has been responding to this new presence of uh, Latin American Latinx materials in the National Design Museum of the United States. It's, it's a big change. It's, it's something really new, you know, from the moment that you were appointed on that position, you are the only curator in this country which has this very specific mission of bringing into the light uh, Latinos and Latin American uh, design and, and designers. So I will love to have some of your feedback on the public you know, the, so far it's been it's been really good. Um, you know, the the Cochineal show that we did, 
that's a small exhibition. That's a small room in our second floor that used to be a bedroom. Um, so it's a very intimate space. And um, every time I'm there, it's very interesting to see the public um, interact with that space and to inter and to think about uh, this material that they didn't know anything about. And, you know, a few times we've actually had um, uh, Mexican tourists who have come and, you know, they take pictures of themselves with like, uh, with the ATACs and within the space. And they're so proud to see that their culture is represented um, in the museum. And, you know, but I, oh, I can't always have a show on view, right? Like that's another thing, like shows, as you know, take a very long time to um, work on and to develop and sometimes, um, it's just not possible. So I also, part of my work is also making sure and really um, trying to champion that my colleagues also include Latino design in their exhibitions too, so that it doesn't only fall on me because I'm the only person and it shouldn't be that this type of material only comes out when I'm doing an exhibition or if I'm gonna you know, do a project or whatever it might be. So part of the work is also um, really championing for, for diversity within my colleagues work, which I've been, I think, really um, lucky that we have been as a curatorial team pushing um, diversity and inclusion and really thinking about our exhibitions in a much more critical way. Well, but so you. far, it's really, it's been really great. I mean, every time we do something, it's like, I, you know, when you do something, you're like, does anyone care? Is anyone excited about it? Um, but we get a lot of really good feedback every time. Um, and, and so it's been, it's been good so far. I don't know if you have any question for me or we should open this uh, for the public for questions because uh, we're a little bit on, on the top of the time. Um, I, I guess my only question for you was, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the work that you just did, this multi-year project you did in reinstalling um, the galleries at your museum, which was a huge undertaking. Um, and so I, I, I think it would be interesting if you talked a little bit about um, that yeah, really silly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, as uh, you know, uh, probably the rest of the week, they don't know that we finally opened in October uh, the Joe Ponte building that was renovated for the last five years. And it was the opportunity to showcase the collection in a, in a very different way. Uh, we have the, the largest and more, most comprehensive collection of, I would say, historical material from Latin America. And as part of this uh, new vision for the, the Mayer Center, uh, we not only you know, are having new galleries, but we reorganized uh, the center in, in a different way now. You know, we drop the terms Spanish colonial and uh, the new world approach. And uh, we wanted to create a kind of a more inclusive and more decolonial vision. So we rename ourselves as a art of uh, Latin America because now we're collecting into the 20th and 21st centuries. And also we separated uh, the ancient materials creating the ancient Americans department. And as part of the, my vision for the, for the major center, uh, like five years ago, uh, we started collecting uh, jointly with the design department materials uh, from the 20th to 21st century, but pieces that really had a very strong connection with historical materials. And uh, for the reinstallation of the new galleries, we included uh, always some uh, art and or objects that uh, 
are from today in dialogue with the pieces from the past. And not only on the Latin American side, but also on the ancient Americas, because many designers, like, for example, we have the, the Lara Hermanos, Hermanos chair, chair uh, is, is in view on the, on the ancient Americas galleries, some uh, textiles that we have from Ramon Valdiosera that connect with some of the pieces that you show us uh, from the 1940s. There are also in view on the ancient American galleries. So the idea has been like bringing uh, this dialogue uh, and, and, and to showcase how designers today, they look uh, for inspiration into all repertoires. And uh, in another exhibition that we have, uh, it's called Revision, a new look of art in the Americas, which is a temporary exhibition also on the Ponte building. We have many materials that connect uh, past and present. And that has been the approach because we face, you know, the reality is that uh, we cannot create an enormous design collection, but we can create a very good focus design collection that uh, has the materials that we will use in the future. This has been a little bit my, my, my direction. And I've been working very closely with Darren Alfred, which is a or curator of design and architecture at the museum. I don't know if you have any. A lot of museums um, now are trying to think of ways in which their more historic collection can be brought to the present. Um, and I know certainly for us at Cooper Hewitt, um, we do want to provide the time and the space for our historic collections to, to be showcased, but also to make it interesting and relevant for, for today's audiences. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that work is really interesting within museum spaces um, because when it's done well, it's really effective. Yeah. Do we have any questions? It looks like we're pretty quiet in the chat, um, but I wanna go ahead and thank both of you so much for your time and especially you, Christina. I know how frustrating it can be when your technology is not working uh, to your it's liking. <laughs> and I, and, and you, uh, I appreciate you so much uh, your patience and staying kind, uh, calm and coming back every time to join us. So thank you for that. And thank you so much, Jorge, for, for joining us as well. Um, I have yet to be to, uh, to visit the Denver Art Museum, but it is now at the top of my list as I hope it is for all of our participants today. Um, and not to fret, if you missed any of today's conversation, you will receive a link to a recording of this dialogue in about a week. So please keep an eye on your inbox for that. Um, and thank you all for joining us. And I hope to see you uh, again in a virtual program soon. So thank you all so much and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye.